Culture today. We are back now with Dan O'Brien. He is our K-State grain market economist, and he is going to cover, as he always does, our weekly grain market update. So, Dan, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Samantha. Absolutely. We've got lots to cover here today, so let's go ahead and get into things, starting with our cash markets. I know that corn and soybeans are really holding fairly strong, but wheat has dropped off. Yes, it has. You know, the um, um, we're seeing cash wheat bids, especially in the last day or so, having having declined. I, I think in, in the overall futures scope of things, uh, some moisture coming into parts of the U.S., that's that that would help in the soil soil profile that that would be needed to help get uh, get uh, winter wheat established again looking for moisture to be available September October uh, so that was responded to the the promise of rain coming in uh, in the next in the next bit of time that was looked at as a as positive production low lowering price situation and also the there with the um, uh, success in getting more wheat out of Ukraine uh, through the, the agreed upon shipment mechanisms that the UN and Turkey were involved in. Uh, we're, I, I think the market sees that information and and uh, uh, resp- responds in a, in with the idea that well, there's less pressure on t- on tightness of supplies. I, I guess I would I think uh, that uh, that might be. In, in, in question, some I I still think the world situation is so tight that yeah we'll welcome any of that wheat coming out of there for humanitarian purposes, uh, but you, you still have ongoing drought in in the European Union and problems elsewhere. And I I think a a quiet issue that that's not being talked about so much is that uh, uh, Russia has a large crop projected to get a lot of wheat out of their country, but there's a I, I understand from from ag market analysis they're, that they're very very their ability to to actually get wheat the world's ability to actually get wheat out of Russia slowed down and probably sanctions other issues all in play so um, I the drop that we'd seen in, in the wheat markets yesterday uh, September contract down 38 cents yes I can see why they why we might rationalize that but but boy there's a long way to go before you declare that uh, that suddenly we're not going to have strength in the wheat markets cash cash prices. Uh, again, this is all be post harvest now for for our hard red winter wheat crops. Uh, still holding up pretty decently. Colby at seven sixty three, uh, Salina more of our export center seven ninety seven, uh, seven ninety seven also in Hutchinson. Those are the two highs in the state. And again, more central central part uh, basis levels strong really sixteen under. And a lot of times for wheat, uh, in uh, when we're not in the middle of a, a, a massive uh, panic run up. You know, we're at 40, 50 cents. Well, here, even at that, at this time, we're 16 under, and that's that's indicating some strength. Topeka, 788, uh, Columbus, uh, 738, even even Colby and Garden City are in, are in the act with uh, about 40, 45, 50 cent under uh, prices. So interesting to look at. I, I would say, and, and as we talked about cash, cash markets, uh, Strong, still strong basis patterns, local demand uh, for corn. Uh, you look at at uh, Garden City at 730 and actually Colby has a top bid of 740 over Garden City, which is rare, rare error for Colby. Uh, you know, Garden City is such a, such a strong area. Uh, Columbus at 720. So you're all looking at a dollar to dollar 10 to a dollar 20 over. And so that just continues uh we hear a lot of discussion, Samantha, uh, amongst uh, in, in the countryside of, of about of uh, livestock feeders, uh, ethanol users, people from out of state offering tremendous forward price bids for for corn in anticipation of where where, where we're at. There, there are uh, worries about uh, the availability of having enough trains to actually pull grain out of the central corn belt over here in, into into western Kansas. So. Uh, to me, I'll, you kind of bring all that together, and I know you you have to balance what you actually see with what you hear might happen. But we're already at a dollar to a dollar twenty over in, in some of these areas, and and uh, uh, just I- indicative of of uh, I wouldn't say panicked buying, but very very aggressive buying. People with businesses on the line, cattle in feedlots, ethanol plants they want to run that are worried about having supplies. So. Gee whiz! You look at that. We're at we're at a dollar to a dollar twenty over. It used to be uh, 
that uh, for a good number of years, we watched the Hereford, Texas bid as, a, as the leading regional bid in, in, for corn in, in, in this part of the world. And they were 40, 60 cents over uh, just uh, with, with the idea that they that bid, yeah, it rewarded corn grown locally, but it was pulling that that was a, a train bid. They were pulling grain out of the eastern corn belt to come to Hereford, Texas. Well, now where we're at uh, with, with these Southwest Kansas bids and well, all of Western Kansas bids, well, and Southeast too, we're, we're operating in, in the same mode, really in a, a massive demand pull mode to try to get corn in. So I know what the futures are doing, but, but in Kansas, we've got, the, we got kind of what corn futures are doing, but in here, in, in this situation this year, we're seeing such, such strong demand that our basis levels are just adding on, stacking on top of whatever strength we get in the, in the corn futures. Sure. And I know when we were talking beforehand, you mentioned an unusual weakness in one of our current areas, and that's in Topeka. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, you know, Topeka uh, is in central Kansas. They've had some uh, eastern Kansas, pardon me. They've had some rains. Uh, I've, I've driven through there of late and uh, they're, they're probably not as worried for in terms of supplies. You have, you have an ethanol plant to the south of there in Garnett. You've got some other things going on. Uh, they they locally probably are not in in for corn anyway. But still, they have a they have a pretty good pretty good corn bid at eighty seven over at seven oh seven. But when you when you look at um, at uh, their forward bid for for harvest, they're at least the highest bid I could find in that area is about five eighty six, and that that's about a uh, you know sixty to eighty cents lower for for a new crop forward contract bid than other areas of the state. So they're not apparently as worried about about securing supplies in a forward manner as these uh, the, as these other parts of the country are uh, of, of the state. Grain sorghum bids, uh, you've got uh, positive basis uh, for in, in the Colby area, twenty five over, even money in, in Salina, even in Garden, uh, seven over in Hutchinson, 50, 50 over in Columbus. So grain sorghum bids aren't as strong as for corn, but they're still pretty strong in most area. Again, the areas. Uh, again, the uh, in Topeka, they're about eighteen under, so that's still historically a great bid, but not as not as uh, uh, as as much of a strenuous demand pull as in other parts of the state. I should mention soybeans, since we're also talk, talk, talk we also paid quite quite a bit of attention to that. A lot of variation across the state. You do see the two western Kansas areas with wider soybean basis bids. We don't have as much soybeans out here, but. Uh, Colby and Garden City at about a dollar under, but then you start heading in, into uh, into Salina and especially Hutchinson and 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 mostly in Gar in Columbus, you're getting from ten under to twenty over. Columbus is twenty over for soybeans, so so you've got some real issues happening there in in, in that local market. Um, you know, I stand back and and look at at the markets and the trends uh, and try to see what, where our momentum is at this, at this stage. Uh, we have, and the, in the materials we have on Ag Manager, we have some weekly continuous futures charts that we're watching. And on a scale of zero being very, very weak and bearish markets to 100 being outstandingly bullish and, and strong markets, 50% 50, uh, 50 being right, right in the middle, just neutral going sideways that, uh, Corn futures right now, and in, in, on that type of scale, they they have a rating of about 43, so they're neutral to to uh, uh, a little bit negative. Uh, the Chicago wheat has a has a uh, a rating on that of about 38, a little bit weaker than corn, 38, 39. Soybeans coming in at about 43, so soybeans and corn at about the same. So we're just in a mode coming off the highs we had of uh, uh, well about a month ago. To, to where we're we're just sort of sideways to going lower. Um, and I, I think it, going forward, we will have uh, uh, new sets of USDA numbers to have to wrestle with. We, we still have a major unanswered question with the uh, dryness now <laughs> that's emerging in Iowa, Minnesota, uh, and the Dakotas with the, <laughs> pardon me, with the uh, uh, US drought monitor showing dry soils, a lot of drawdown. <clears throat> Pardon me. A lot of drawdown in the uh, in soil soil profile moisture, and uh, and the need to keep bringing timely rains every week to overcome what's what we don't have in the rest of soil profile. But 
but yet we can't we can't still survive through if we, if we keep getting just nursed along in terms of rainfall. So you've got areas that that are on the precipice of being of, of really seeing declines in their yields. And we already know that's happening in the central and southern plains, but we but I, it sure bears watching in terms of what's happening up in as as we said in Iowa, southern Minnesota, and the Dakotas. Uh, they 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 have the potential if they don't if they don't get uh, bailed out by timely rains to to really start to see some yield declines and, and on, on corn and and the possibility of that happening on soybeans also. Absolutely. Yet another, you know, reaffirming of the fact that we'll find a bit more stability in September when we know a little bit more what we're dealing with here. But more to come on that for sure. And then I think that stability would come from sure knowledge. Now that 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 uh, we I guess uh, the amount of uncertainty we hope would go away <laughs> or, yeah. and we'd be able to plan more readily. Uh, but but right now we've had those August numbers, a lot of uncertainty around them, as, as you and I have just been talking about. And and I, I think we'll have a clearer picture where we really are coming in at once we get to September and then October and November. But at this time, we're uh, we're uh, we, you and I, as well as everybody else, is just trying to figure out how this uh, how this situation is going to work out for the rest of summer. Absolutely. And then in terms of let's see here, what was I about to mention? Oh, in terms of weather, we've been talking about weather. It's the common theme, the drought that's going on. We've got some distinctive weather patterns that are appearing in the Corn Belt specifically, which is, of course, of major concern because not right. only is that impacting our grain markets, but it's also going to affect our cattle markets as well. So we're not looking optimistic here in that realm of things, are we? I I think that... Um... Uh, you know, Glenn Tonzer, our, our friend and colleague, could could uh, talk quite a bit about the impact we've already had on uh, on the cow herd and what what that what that will bring about. What what's almost forcing to happen uh, in coming months in terms of of, of uh, live livestock numbers for placement and feedlots. Uh, what in terms of meat markets. Uh, you know, beef markets in particular in our neck of the world, what what type of impact that will have on feed demand probably be lower in some of these areas. So we've got some real dynamic uh, and uh, challenging, i.e. troubling things happening. I, I hear good discussion, no doubt you too, and talking, you, you as well, and talking with people about just the availability of hay in some of these areas, just really, really sought after and and uh, tough, tough market. So, so I, I think uh, for us, we've been so affected by this by this Western Corn Belt uh, event. Uh, again, the ongoing La Nina weather pattern that we've had that uh, that it's kind of central in our thinking. We have had some discussion from uh, from uh, climatologists who who've indicated that we could be in line for a third year of La Nina, uh, and and uh, that and that's. It's not unprecedented, but as you as you start to string these together, you're starting to look more like the 1930s than a regular in and out pattern. So we hope we hope that doesn't happen. But but uh, until that weather pattern actually solves itself and goes away, there is that risk, and that that uh, adds questions for us for for our cropping plans and uh, really our financial plans heading off into 2023. Absolutely. And we'll hopefully here soon in the future have more on the similarities that we're seeing here today compared to, like you mentioned, the 1930s with our meteorologist, Chip Redman, and our assistant climatologist, Matt Siddle. So listeners, stay tuned for that because I'm sure that'll be an insightful conversation for sure. And one that I'm a interested in, and I'm sure listeners are as well. And so am I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some eerie similarities for sure. But Dan, as always, thank you so much for your time this week. Thank you very much, Samantha. Take care. You as well. Once again, that was Dan O'Brien. He is our grain market economist here at K-State covering this week's grain market report. We'll be back with more ahead on agriculture today.